Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Ricardo Vinuesa. I'm an associate professor at the KTH in Stockholm. And today I'm going to tell you more about our work on PINs, Physics in Four Neural Networks, to solve the RANS equations. This is work uh, funded by the ERC, the European Research Council, and also by VR, uh, the Swedish Research Council. So let me tell you a little bit more about uh, what we do in this work. Uh, we basically take the 2D runs equations, uh, and uh, of course uh, we have the closure problem in the 2D runs, uh, and we want to uh, avoid, in this case, having to come up with models for the Reynolds stresses. So we will just solve numerically these equations without introducing any model for the Reynolds stresses. And for that, we're going to use the framework of PINs, Physics in Four Neural Networks, where uh, we're going to essentially exploit the machinery that exists to train neural networks. Eh? So we're going to use the automatic differentiation to calculate gradients, eh? and those gradients will be used to form the governing equations, and then we're going to minimize the residual of these PDEs, these partial differential equations, uh, to try to, well, to try to see what is the performance of this way of solving the governing equations. <coughs> this is work by Hamid Reza Eivasi and other collaborators. This is published in Physics of Fluids, where you can find here the full reference, more details, and also all the codes and all the, the data is available. And so feel free to reach out to us uh, if you want more information on using the codes and also the data that will be discussed today. Now, what are we doing when using pins for training uh, and solving these PDs? I mean, of course, uh, what we know, if we take a classical numerical solver, is that we would discretize the governing equations, and uh, in the case of um, runs, we will come up with, uh, with some assumptions to, to tackle the closure problem. We will uh, infer uh, some behavior for the Reynolds stresses, and then we will solve that uh, in the case of commercial codes with a finite volume code, and we'll get some, some results. Now, these methods are uh, <coughs> very efficient to do that computationally. Uh, perhaps the only drawback is that we need to come up with terms for the Reynolds stresses. We need to, well, basically uh, use a model. And in uh, more challenging scenarios with pressure gradients, with separation, with a strong curvature, then this is known to uh, exhibit uh, slightly, slightly problematic results, no? depending on the configuration and how far away you are from the calibration data. <coughs> what we use here is uh, to use a neural network to minimize the residual of the PDEs. We don't include any term for the Reynolds stresses. The Reynolds stresses will be additional variables to be solved in our, in our unknown vector, basically. And our loss function will have two terms. One term, which is essentially the uh, residual of the governing equations. This is the first term. And the second term, which is essentially being able to match in a supervised way the boundary data. Okay? <clears throat> so this schematic representation here shows a little bit what uh, we are trying to do. So this is a domain where the boundary is information that we provide to the model. And this is, uh, this is important because we require the boundary data to be able to solve this using pins. Um, of course, one could think of a, an experimental setup where we have some measurements and then we want to really reconstruct the rest, for example. Uh, so knowing this information, what we have is these points inside the domain, <coughs> which are going to be our collocation points, where we will be able to uh, solve our governing equations, the 2D runs equations, incompressible in this case. Now, uh, why is it interesting to use pins and not just uh, a numerical solver to do this? Well, it turns out that uh, exploiting the automatic differentiation, uh, which is inherent to neural networks, we can get away with coarser meshes. <laughs> so we don't really need to solve very, very finely all the gradients, eh? and you would still get uh, basically exact derivatives and quite high, uh, highly detailed approximations of these terms in our in our domain. Of course, pins uh, is going to be uh, well, it's going to be more expensive eh, for the same computational mesh than uh, using a numerical solver. Eh? But the advantage is that with pins you can get away with a coarser mesh uh, than with, for example, with a runs uh, typical runs approach. So for these comparisons, uh, if you take a standard runs solver and you take the approach that we use with pins on a coarser mesh, the computational cost will be quite similar in both cases. With the advantage that in pins, uh, well, we would have a better representation of the Reynolds stresses because we are not embedding any model there. So our loss function is made up of that unsupervised loss, eh, the residual inside the domain, and this boundary data which is supervised 
uh, where we want to uh, match the information at the boundaries. <clears throat> the number of collocation points uh, that you are using in your, in your uh, lattice uh, basically comes from a trade-off. If we have too few points, our computational cost will be very low, but we will not be able to propagate effectively the information to the boundaries to match the supervised part of the loss. And if we have many, many points, uh, well, we will have a very good matching of the boundary data, but that our computational cost will be higher. And then maybe the advantage with respect to uh, a more traditional industrial simulation uh, will, be, will be smaller. Okay? Now, this is what the setup looks like in TensorFlow. So you can actually see that uh, the implementation in TensorFlow is just a few lines. It's, it's quite uh, straightforward to do. Uh, and of course, you can see additional details and all the codes uh, if you go to that reference. So all the information is available. But I just want to illustrate that this is a quite a straightforward implementation just because of the capabilities and the embedded automatic differentiation that we have uh, in this case in TensorFlow, but that you would have in any library not to implement uh, neural networks. So let's look at some examples of application of this uh, PINS methodology. We're going to start with the Falkner scan boundary layer. This is a very simple case. This is a laminar pressure gradient uh, boundary layer, uh, which can be solved quite easily. Eh? You can actually get the results uh, in MATLAB in a uh, few seconds. Uh, but we want to um, take a sanity check. We want to see if PINs is able to solve a case where you don't have any turbulence eh? and we have a quite clean, quite easy solution uh, and what we actually can get. Uh, what you see, we're showing you the, 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 basically the errors no? in the U, V and P. So these are the mean velocities in the stringwise and wall normal directions and P would be the pressure. And you can see that the errors are uh, less than 0.1%, right? So for this very simple case, for this straightforward application, uh, we can actually get very good performance from pins. So this is a quite reassuring uh, proof of concept no? that this uh, can be a quite uh, good approach. And uh, we want to go to progressively more complicated cases to see in the cases of turbulence, what do we get? Uh, in the second case, we're going to look at a zero pressure gradient turbulent boundary layer. Okay, so here we have a well, reasonably um, well-established boundary layer. Uh, the Reynolds number goes up to Ari Theta 8000 based on momentum thickness. So it's a quite uh, higher Reynolds number. Uh, and we can actually see, we have a quite complete database down here, and we can actually see what the performance looks like. You see that in this case, the mean gets 1% error. Uh, so the boundary layer development is very well characterized. But even when we look at the Reynolds stresses, the performance is actually pretty good. So we get very small deviations in the Reynolds stresses, but something certainly much better than what you would get with an industrial simulation and certainly being able to, uh, well, to reproduce the an anisotropy you know, that you will have in, in turbulent boundary layers. No? So in principle, we can get quite a good performance with zero pressure gradient turbulent boundary layers. Uh, but of course, we want to go to more challenging cases. So in this case, we will consider a turbulent boundary layer subjected to an adverse pressure gradient. An adverse pressure gradient uh, is, of course, uh, well, producing uh, a deceleration of the flow because the boundary layer is, uh, when it's developing downstream, is seeing more and more pressure, which means that uh, the flow will naturally increase its wall normal velocity and it will decelerate. Uh, the free stream velocity will get lower and lower. So in this case, uh, we actually uh, established quite well-controlled pressure gradient conditions. Yeah? So the database, you can find it over here. That's uh, Bob Key and others. This is in JFM. And we set up a beta constant and equal to one. <laughs> beta is the uh, rota clauser pressure gradient parameter, uh, which is basically the displacement thickness over the wall shear stress multiplied by the stringwise pressure gradient. And keeping this parameter constant allows us to have well-controlled pressure gradient conditions uh, in what we call near equilibrium. No? In near equilibrium, you will have cell similarity in the outer region at high enough Reynolds numbers. So technically, this case is slightly more complex than the one that we saw before, because the one before was a zero pressure gradient boundary layer, uh, but this one uh, has a quite simple flow history. Uh, the pressure gradient is constant, so there is not so much complexity in terms of development of the boundary layer, but at the same time, uh, the wall normal convection produced by the pressure gradient 
uh, basically transfers some of the fluctuations from the near world to the outer region, a fact that will complicate the, the predictions, no? because the flow becomes less and less canonical, let's say. Still, we can see excellent predictions, eh, like uh, less than 1% uh, error in the mean, very good predictions in the Reynolds stresses. I mean, they are few percent, eh, but uh, we are getting quite well even the behavior in the outer region eh, of the Reynolds stresses, still better than you would get in uh, industrial simulations. This is something that can be also appreciated here when we're trying to understand a bit the boundary layer development. And therefore, this motivates to go to an even more complex configuration. So this is a, a more complicated flow case. Eh? This is uh, a turbulent wing. This is something that we have discussed in some of the previous videos. Uh, and this is in particular a NACA 4412 wing section at an angle of attack of 5 degrees. Uh, so we have a flow that is attached all on the whole section side of the wing, but close to detachment in the trailing edge. And more importantly, the pressure gradient is not constant in this case. The rota clauser pressure gradient parameter will be increasing dramatically as the flow evolves in the streamwise direction over here um, because of the effect of the curvature of the wing. So you're really inducing a progressively stronger and stronger adverse pressure gradient. So we are not in near equilibrium conditions, we are actually imposing a progressively stronger and stronger adverse pressure gradient. <clears throat> this database can be found in this reference. Eh? So this is in the International Journal of Heat and Fluid Flow. You can see um, there we show uh, databases uh, at Reynolds numbers based on momentum, uh, on, on the streamwise velocity and the core length ranging from 100,000 up to a million. We're going to take the 200,000 case, which is turbulent, is well-established turbulence, but not so, tur not so extreme turbulent conditions. And we're going to try to see the boundary layer development in both cases. Yeah? So we're going to see how we can actually use spins to make relevant predictions in this flow configuration. So what I'm showing you here are the various profiles. Eh? This is the mean and the Reynolds stresses, the stringwise velocity fluctuations, and then we have the whole normal and also the Reynolds shear stress. Uh, what you can see is that uh, we get the mean with very, very good uh, accuracy. So we get 1.5% error in the mean. That's great. In the Reynolds stresses, we are on the order of 7, 9, around 10% error. Uh, which, I mean, of course, is slightly larger, but again, in a case with non-equilibrium um, conditions and quite strong anisotropy, uh, this is a pretty, good, a pretty good representation of the flow that we can obtain thanks to the, pins, um, to the pins approach. In fact, we can actually see that the outer peak and the behavior in the outer layer, which is quite pronounced in the case of uh, strong average pressure gradients, this is something that pins can reproduce very, very well. So, in principle, these are very, very encouraging results right, that can allow us to have uh, excellent performance uh, in quite complex uh, scenarios. And that motivates our last uh, example of today. This is a periodic hill. The periodic hill is, uh, which you can see schematically down here, the periodic hill is a quite uh, well-known uh, case for testing turbulence models uh, because, well, you have this uh, input uh, channel. This is periodic in the streamwise direction, and you have this gentle hill over here where there will be a separation. Yeah? And then, of course, you go back to the original height at the end of the domain, uh, which will induce a quite a strong favorable pressure gradient there. So if we focus on the hill that you have at the, at the, after the inflow uh, to our domain, uh, you can see that there will be this, well, this separation bubble. Uh, and you can see that pins can reproduce very accurately the, the separation point and the, and the reattachment location of this separation bubble. So even in cases with quite pronounced separation, we can obtain excellent predictions using pins. Less than 3% error in the mean, remember, involving a case with mean separation and reattachment. So this is, again, quite remarkable no? compared with what uh, would be possible with industrial runs models. And then the Reynolds stresses, they are then on the, on the order of 10, 20% error, so slightly larger, but still of the right qualitative behavior and with an adequate representation of the uh, anisotropy. So in principle, even in this case, which is quite complex, uh, it's very encouraging what we can do with pins. So I would like to uh, highlight that pins works pretty well um, in uh, cases where you have limited measurements eh, and perhaps you want to enhance experimental data, perhaps you want to have boundary data that you want to uh, apply some super resolution. Uh, and at the end, uh, if we want to compare pins with uh, other numerical approaches to solve PDs, uh, in some cases, in some niche cases, pins is going to be a good, uh, a good choice. Okay? In other cases, a regular numerical solver may be a better alternative. 
In the context of experiments, I would like to highlight a couple of examples here um, in this article uh, that is published in Measurement Science and Technology. Yeah? So you can see the full reference over here. What we did was to take PAV data and uh, try to uh, enhance the PAV measurements in a zero pressure gradient turbulent boundary layer. And so I'm showing you the mean uh, string wise velocity, the mean wall normal velocity, and also the Reynolds stresses. What you can see is that the Reynolds stresses are slightly improved with respect to the reference data. So if we compare this with DNS or high resolution LES data, pins can improve uh, slightly the Reynolds stresses, but more importantly, the wall normal velocity. So this line over here would be the wall normal velocity measured by the PID. This is much, much smaller than the string wise component. So it's a, a component that is difficult to measure accurately experimentally. Uh, but PINs allows us to have excellent agreement with reference, with reference high fidelity data, through being able to match all the information that you have in your governance equations, the mean components, the Reynolds stresses, leading to a significant correction of the wall normal velocity. Again, there is an improvement of the Reynolds stresses, but here the best uh, performance is actually from the wall normal velocity. So again, the reference is here, published in Measurement Science and Technology. And the last example is about eliminating noise. <clears throat> so you can see how if we consider a 2D cylinder eh, and we are looking at the flow and the POD modes eh, that we can eh, extract from the flow, uh, and we add noise, so we really contaminate the signal with quite high levels of noise, pins can denoise the signal. Pins can actually uh, identify what part of the signal is consistent with the physics, in this case the governing equations that we have, the Navier-Stokes equations, um, and what part is basically noise. So for experimental applications, pins can actually help to enhance some turbulence statistic measurements and also to remove some of the noise and some of the unknown information that you can have from your data. This uh, denoising study is based in archive, so you can see the reference over here. Yeah, this is uh, quite some detailed representations and quite some detailed descriptions there. And as always, if you have any questions or you want to access the data or the codes, feel free to reach out because we will be more than happy to share them and to collaborate. And uh, I would like to thank everybody who made this video possible. I would like to thank uh, Infravis, the KTH Visualization Studio, as well as the KTH Digitalization Platform. Uh, and I would like to invite you to, to contact us. Here's my email information, my lab uh, website. So if you want to discuss something, if you want to collaborate, uh, get some codes, feel free to reach out. My social media and again in the YouTube channel, you can see other videos of other studies that we are working on. Uh, and probably we can come up with some nice collaborations and ideas to do something together. For now, thank you very much for uh, watching this and see you in the next video. Bye.